thank you for indulging us in, uh, in uh, including you in this narrative because you see, uh, the, the last part is what always gets me. I don't know about you, but I don't know where this place is where there's going to be weeping yeah. and gnashing of teeth. I, I thought that it might be that there was somebody trying to teach us that there was everlasting hellfire. And, and I just thought that that couldn't be. But there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth of all those who have this particular attitude. So that's the word. That's the word that I want you to be focusing on as Jordan and I talk here about this in a moment. Because I'm, I'm going to allow Jordan to play a game with us uh, uh, for, for a moment. Are you ready for a game? I know that we just had children's story and you're saying, well, I'm not a child. I didn't come to church to play games. Well, you did this morning. Okay, you already had to pull out your, hymn, your, your Bibles for the first time in, you know, like months. Okay, so that's good. That's good. So you've seen the paper. You know that the Bible is real. And these are the words of Jesus who's telling one of his famous stories about the king and the three guys. Okay, so Jordan, what game do you want to play with us? Well, I think I know what you're going to pull on me here. Uh, and it's one that we used to play on the playgrounds of all my little Christian school years and like elementary school. It's like, who's your favorite Bible character? Is that where you're going? That's where I'm going. Yeah, that's where we're going. Okay, so we're going to play who's your favorite Bible character. Jordan, uh, what's your, <laughs> who's your favorite Bible character? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so this is he going to seem, play he's up here. seem a little uh, disjointed. We'll try and bring it back around. But when we were talking, getting ready for this week, I mentioned that uh, my one of my favorite characters from the Bible has always been Gideon because he's so relatable for me um, in that, you know, one of the first things you find out about him is, is he's talking with God. He says, prove it's you. And God says, all right, it's me. And then he says, well, that could have been luck. Prove it again. And that's so, you know, very relatable for me. I need, I need to have, like, you know, the assurance that I'm on the right path. Jordan used a very scientific term when we were talking. He said, double blind study. <laughs> Okay, some of you scientists out there know what we're talking about. We need to be very, very sure. And so therefore, you do these, these studies that are similar, but they're in different places, and they have the same, same exact metrics and everything. This is, this is Gideon. Yeah, and we were talking about it, to, to bring it back into context, we were saying that for me, Gideon was relatable uh, for different reasons at different points in my life, but the point of it was that his perspective of God was always very... Um, transparent. You knew what he thought about it. He's like, all right, dude, this isn't my plan. This isn't how I would have played it, but you're putting me on this path, so I'm going to follow you because my perspective is that you know more than I do. And, uh, and this story is, is all about these people's perspective of their master. Correct. That's the relationship, but I just want to just be sure that you're remembering this piece of the story of Gideon first. We know that Gideon did the whole trumpet and pitcher and torch piece, right? With 300 of the last standing men. Do you remember that piece of the story? This is the prequel. This is the prequel to that story when Gideon is approached first by God. And you must understand that he's, he's living in a time when Israel is, is under oppression. Does any, does any good little Bible student out there want to tell me uh, where was Gideon when the angel approached him? He, we know that he was threshing his grain, but where was... Because this is very... This is genius. This is actually quite genius. Under pressure, he's still got to harvest and thresh his grain and keep it from being stolen by the oppressors. So... Where was he located with his grain? In a wine press. Thank you. You're not going to look for grain in a wine press, right? Wine presses in those days were basic holes in the ground where they would, they would first they would squish the grapes and then there was a deeper hole into which the wine would flow. Okay, if you don't believe me, just go to the garden tomb in Jerusalem and there is such a wine press there. Okay. Uh, you can see it. You can see it for yourself. So that's one of the ways that they made wine. So he's very sneaky. He's going to be successful. And here comes the angel. And under this pressurized situation, raise your hand if you lived in a pressurized situation of any kind this week. Okay. So no pressure. Grace had no pressure this week. It was easy. <laughs> 
So, so much. So, okay. All right. Can you didn't raise even, the hands. You didn't even notice. You didn't even notice. You can't even raise your hand. It's, it's still trembling. <laughs> with, with, uh, okay. So we've all, we're, I, I want you to relate to this guy, Gideon, uh, in a big way. And I'm glad that Jordan chose him. So <laughs> he, he wants to be sure. He makes God do the miracle not once, but twice. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, It's about our attitude towards God. And it's really an attitude, in this case, I want us all to relate to the fact that it's an attitude towards God while we are under pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, We live in this world. We're under pressure. Some of us, yourself included, went to a funeral in the last seven days. I went to a place last night where my friend, who is the main speaker, he's, he's done four funerals already this month in his church. And he's got two more to go, one today and one later this week. Uh, it's, it's an incredible pressure that he is under right now. So under pressure, Gideon says, hey, the dew could have been on the fleece. I should have asked for the other way around. And so he asked God for the other way around. And what does God do? He does it for him. He does it. And so I think... You know, we talked about God meeting you where you are. That's right. And I'm sure we'll dive more into that later. But mm-hmm. the commonality between that, you know, Old Testament story and the parable here is that as people, we all have our own view on God and what his character is. And it really frames the entire relationship. So you look at how people interact with him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the Old Testament story, it led to this, you know, what we have. Obviously, we've all read it a bunch of times. In the parable, you see three, you know, different perspectives on 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 display. Well, really two. two, yeah, two, yeah. but three is a good number, so you're going to yeah, duplicate you go. the first two and make mm-hmm. the third guy feel really bad about it. So, <laughs> um, but but the whole root of it is what what do you think God is there to do, and what do you expect Him to do, and um, sure. Well, you've, you've got the first two guys. One's given five bags of... I like that translation. Did you like that? Bag of gold. I mean, it's like the guy won one big because his master decides to give him five bags of gold. And, and, and then the other guy gets, gets two bags of gold and one gets one bag of gold. Um, these guys are then given the opportunity in the absence... Very interesting. Nobody looking over their shoulder. Kind of like... We think we're living, even though, as we're taught, Jesus knows everything, right? Okay, so we just put that aside, and we think God is away somewhere out in the universe, and he's left us here, and he's given us life, and he said, okay, now what are you going to do with it? And there's the guy with five, who goes out and somehow, because we're not told, makes another five. Doubles, doubles. Okay, so there's this doubling, this doubling thing. And when they get back, he is pretty proud, I think, or feeling accomplished and able to stand in his master's presence and say, you gave me this, I made this. How do you feel? Master says, great, well done. Isn't that what we're all looking for? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay, so then you contrast, we contrast that with this other guy. And I, I got to tell you, this story, we didn't really touch on this much, but this one really confused me as a kid, because I read through that parable and I was like, yeah, I feel for the third guy. This dude only gives him one one talent. As opposed, it, clearly he's got his favorites and this last guy isn't, so you know. Yeah. It said it, it, did, did, you catch, did you catch the little piece? According, According to, to their the, ability. To their abil- does, does that make you feel better or worse about this? <laughs> Does that mean if I got the lesser, if I only got the two bags of gold, that God, I'm not really as intelligent as the guy who got five then, right? Well, yeah, but at the end of the story, it's not about, you know, the sum of the gold, it's about what you did with it. And so that's, Agreed. you know, the share in the master's happiness doesn't say share in this percentage of the master's happiness because you only earned this much. It's... That, that, I, I told you the story and I, I said I wasn't going to say it, but I am yeah. going to say it. There are friends of mine who have done, how shall we say, greater things within the Adventist church. They're conference presidents now. Uh, they're doing these big and amazing things. 
and you know, here am I. Stuck with me. With, with, with you, that's right, you know. <laughs> when those thoughts come, when those thoughts come, I'm going to remember what you just said. I'm going to remember <laughs> that it's not about how many bags of gold. It's not about how many members. You know, that's what everybody asks a pastor when they come to a new church. Oh, how many members? So, like, like the guy with the, the thousand member church must be worth more. Than, than the guy with, 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 with the 250 member church. Is that, is, that, is that what this story teaches you? Thank you, Jordan. Thank you for pointing out that it's the fact that there was an increase and the master was happy and got the attaboy, got the well done. Didn't matter what they were doing, they got the attaboy. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling really good about that. Yeah, man, I got I really you. Are. <laughs> totally intentional too. Thank so. you, thank you, thank you. Because I, you know, I, I love, I love I, what I'm doing. And and when when you compare yourselves to your workmates, to other people in your field, and and you're told you are less than, just understand that there is a different set of metrics that are being used upon you at that moment, and they are not the metrics of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven metrics say, if God gives you something to do and you go out and do it, you will get the attaboy. Is that, is that something we can all go home and say, yay, I want to be part of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of this world really does not measure up. Yeah, but I think initially it's sort of a yay with a question mark because what we had talked about a lot, you know, earlier this week was that it's so counter to what we have on display as, you know, mm -hmm. as a part of this world. There's no real model that mimics that kingdom experience. And so when you're when you're really throwing yourself and following what Jesus is sort of suggesting, it's going to make you look a little crazy by comparison. Kind of going back to that, I'm going to sell everything and buy a field where this dude buried a bag of gold for some reason. I don't know if there's any continuity in the parable world, but this guy hid his bag in a field, and I'm just saying that's like a risky proposition now. No well, uh, we, know, we know from studying the, the parable of the, the, the hidden treasure that this was not an unusual uh, practice to, right. to hide your stuff. Okay? There you go. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, attitude and or motive are different here. So for me, my first thought, if I'd been given a bunch of gold, wouldn't be to go... Nest. I always assumed as a kid that the guy who had five just kind of did some like betting on horse races or something, which maybe says more about me. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a little natural for Easy me money. to think, Easy money. if I'm given money, I got to protect it, I got to hide it, I got to make sure, you know, nobody... This doesn't decrease. My first thought wouldn't necessarily be to make it increase. So, but that's, that's a very human... Mm -hmm. kind of model of thinking mm -hmm. um, but to, to look at it from a different point I know you're going to get into this next month with the mm -hmm. upside, upside down. down kingdom but um, there is a little bit of rewiring that you have to let God do at least for me I have to sort of let him alter my expectations um, so change, that I can change your metrics so that I can participate because if you are grading yourself by the metrics you see on a day to day basis it's, it's not going to add up right no, it's not. We, uh, Chris is out there. She was le leading in one of the classes today, my wife, and the lesson study this quarter is on stewardship. So it's, there's a lot of crossover right now. If, if you've been studying that lesson, then, then you know that it's, it's kind of interesting that God has asked all of us to participate in this whole thing. So that's why we, we said when we decided on the four that we were going to do this particular parable had had to be in there, um, not because we're studying stewardship, but because um, it just goes to one's attitude. And I think that that, that is the, the huge word for me here, that, that the difference between guy number one, guy number two, and then guy number three is, for me, it comes across in the language. That you were really focused on. Yes. Whenever, whenever we would read through the parable, you'd get his mic voice on and say, I knew you were a hard man, and he'd do that uh -huh. thing. So he'd always you were really, a hard man. Right, he'd lean into it like that. So he <laughs> really brought us to the point where, you know, this guy almost comes at the master with a, with a hostile attitude. It's like... Uh, did, you, did you pick that up as well in the language? He does not like the master. You reap 
where you have not sown. <laughs> really? You, you, you're going to talk to your boss that way? Okay, this, this has a, a very, very interesting uh, dynamic going on here. Again, attitude towards, attitude towards God. This is, this is the major difference I'm seeing between five, five bags of gold and two bags of gold and one bag of gold. It, it, the clincher for me <laughs> is, is the way he doesn't even mention the gold. Right. He says, I hid what was yours. Okay. It's very so like, catty. Excellent word. <laughs> catty. This, this guy, yeah. So we, we had talked about how uh, sometimes there's, it seems like there's a sense of entitlement that people have when they're in a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. um, and that you feel like if you're a church person and you're, mm -hmm. you're here and you, you, you have, there's an indent on the pew where your butt regularly sits, you know, you, you're entitled to certain kind of, you know, um, like a coupon at the store somewhere, some, something that you get the sort of as a... The heavenly coupon redemption. Right. Uh, yes. So, oh, wow. And then when you don't, you know, and that's not given to you, and I've had this happen, and this is, we, going back to the Gideon thing we talked about, I, I joked with the pastor saying that when I was, you know, a young teenager, just in all the junior guide stories, I sort of had a, an expectation that, yes, Jesus was my friend, and, you know, he's my God, but he's also my magic eight ball, and if I ask him the right question, he's going to give me the answer. And that didn't quite pan out, um, and, and it was an opportunity for me to get kind of catty about it, too. It's like, well, I thought you were so smart, I thought you were going to tell me. Mm -hmm. But we have sometimes an, an issue of, of expecting that we have more of a right to things than we might actually have, or we want to take ownership of, of things that are actually God's responsibility to take care of. And so this the impression I get from the third servant is that he feels like he's probably a hard worker and he yeah. feels like he's, you know, been busting chops and that it's not fair and that the does, situation... Does he feel underappreciated because he only got one? Maybe. That, that his master's evaluation of him was, you are not a five bag of gold kind of guy, you're just a one bag of gold kind of guy. Uh, and, and maybe he disagreed with his, his master's evaluation of, of his talents, of, of his, his abilities. Well, regardless of why they disagreed, there's very clearly a disconnect when I read it between uh, what this guy thinks he's entitled to and and he thinks that the master doesn't play fair. He's, it seems like he's applying a different metric than the master is. Correct. And so there's this, you know, big clash. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for, for him to come at him straight, it's like not even a welcome home. He's like, no. yeah, it's, it's out in the field. You can go dig your stuff up if you want. Yes. Um, it's a very different mindset. And to me, the, the, the gold in this story is almost secondary to that attitude and that perspective. It just that, happened to be gold. Right. Um, but it really says a lot. And I think the caution for me when I read the story is, is to... Um, to just try and reframe what you think your purpose here to do is. You know, if you're if you're here to preserve, if you're here to just maintain, if you're here to um, just kind of coast, that's one thing. But this story sort of tells me that you're supposed to do some of that risking that we've been talking about and, mm -hmm. and to actively engage in this communal experience we've been called to be a part of. Um, and that takes the courage. I don't know if you want to broach that one. I, yet, I, I absolutely do. Um, to we, we actually got into this a little bit in, in the Sabbath school class today. The it does it it takes it takes courage to to live by these different metrics. The metrics of the kingdom of heaven are so so not normal for us that uh, we we feel strange doing it until. Till such time as we make some decisions, I'm going to I'm going to out uh, out Barry right now and say uh, Barry made a decision based on the fifty dollar thing that we did earlier this year. Remember that we gave ten people fifty dollars and said uh, go bless somebody in the name of the kingdom of heaven with this. Uh, Barry did one step further. He invited Annette to join him in putting together bags that he carries around in his truck so that when he saw somebody in need, actually somebody maybe with their hand out, instead of handing them money, he would hand them this bag. It had a hat in it, it had 
It had what, what else, Barry? Uh, Socks, blood, sock, water, water. Okay. Really, really great idea. Okay, somebody who's living on their own is is probably going to need these things at some time or another. And um, you know, by by making sure by you donating those things to them at that moment, you can be assured that you're you're obviously not donating alcohol or drugs to them, which is an assurance that maybe we would like. Uh, so there was there was this proactive. Thank you, Barry. There was this proactive approach to living in the now, but living by the principles of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, uh, that's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Uh, I mentioned to the class that, that just last night I had this, this ah, um, guy comes in the parking lot of the, the church that Chris and I were visiting last night in, in Desert Hot Springs and, and asks for money for supper. Uh, I, I told him, rightly, that I, I did not have any cash. He was looking for cash. I, I had a credit card. And there was a restaurant right around the corner, which I went in and ate at and paid with my credit card. Is this true confessions? Okay. You do you, man. Okay. Um, I'm doing this singing thing with my friend at this church, and we're singing How Great Thou Art. I'm belting it out. I'm the lead singer. And who do you think rolls in the back door in his electric wheelchair? It's the same guy. I want you to know my conscience was smitten. You know, how great thou art. How great do you really think God is, Mike? That you couldn't spare a moment to go buy that guy supper. You judged him. And I did. I, I, I confessed to you this morning. I judged him and I judged him as not deserving of what I could do for him. Now, speaking of attitude of servant number three towards the master, his very judgmental attitude towards God, towards the master, I was there. I was there last night. Harsh, I'm telling you. I, 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 I'm going to try. I'm going I'm to try not to let that happen again. Try my best to not let that happen again. Figure out some way that I can be of assistance to God because he been very, very generous with me. You believe that? Believe God's being generous with you? You're alive right now. Bobby tells me, this is my friend, he tells me that one of the funerals he's doing this week is a lady who told her son to go and check on his brother and when the son came back, she was dead of an aneurysm. So how'd you like that? Folks, we don't know. We just don't know. You have come to church today. I've come to church today. I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. I've made arrangements to, to and this is, this is not to tell our good works or anything, but we have, we have said yes to to a lady who wants to do a fundraiser this evening uh, for, the, for the fire victims. Uh, and she's doing it here at the church, and she's a yoga instructor, and people are going to pay her to give them instruction on yoga, and she's going to donate the proceeds to the, to the fire victims. Okay? We've made arrangements to, to uh, open the church or open the fireside room so they can get set up at 4.30, and then after Sabbath they're going to have their little thing at 7. Okay? That's the plan. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Do you, do you know what? Do you know that you're even going to make it to lunch today? <laughs> you know, you're hoping. <laughs> you're even deciding right now where you're going to eat. <laughs> and how early these two clowns are going to let you get to? There it. you go. There you go. It's, 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 it's this attitude thing that I struggle with. It's this, this thing that God says... Um, I will do this for you now. Trust me. Right. It's this. Um, I like. I like the word you used. Entitlement. Um, how much do I feel that God has to give me what I want? And if if I have that attitude, am I really like guy number three um, in in my attitude towards God? 
Um, because I've watched what God does with other people. And, and you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm like Jonah. Hmm. You, ever, you ever think about Jonah that way? He gets a lot of grief, but boy, he's relatable too if you, if you yeah. stop and walk. Yeah. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because God has a track record in his life. Do you ever think about that? He says, I don't want to go. I'm going to Tarshish because every time you say, God, that you're going to do something, you don't do it. And then you find out at the end of the book of Jonah, yet again, you're going to burn, you're going to burn. This is Jonah. You're going to burn, you're going to burn. If you don't turn to God, they all turn to God and God doesn't burn them. Jonah's sitting up on the top of the hill and he's going, see God, see, I told you. Uh, you said that you were going to roast these people and you didn't, you didn't. What's with that? I, I, I don't want to be your prophet anymore. So I don't know if you've had that kind of a relationship with God. Maybe servant number three had had this kind of relationship with God. You're a hard man. You get where you don't sow. You reap where you don't sow. And so he has this, this, this attitudinal thing that happens with him. Um, God's going to get the glory. I think we should, come to, we, we should all just come to terms with that. We really, really should. God is going to get the glory one way or another. Either we give it to him or he is going to just get it anyway. So um, if, if you don't believe me, well, you don't believe me. And, and you don't believe God either. But he is going to get the glory and, it, and, and he, he owns the gold. And so when he makes an account of it from us someday, it's either going to be well done or it's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the reassuring part for me when I read that is it's, you know, God does get the glory, but he's offered us the chance to share in it. And so it's not like he says, hold this for me, I'll be right back to take it all back from you. It says, hold this, do something with it, and then we can both party about how awesome it is. Indeed. So Indeed. that's, you know, that's that's a reassuring thing for me. And And you were talking about that difference in attitude, and, and I was just thinking how it's kind of a thin line, and it's, it's one that shifts. We, we've talked over the past couple of weeks how you might be in one place on Wednesday and be in a different place on Friday. Mm -hmm. but in your, in your journey, you your know, spiritual you, journey. You yeah. can even draw a little cross parallel and say that the first two servants, you know, said, look what I did, is dangerously close to the Pharisee we were talking about last week. Mm -hmm. See what I have done. And mm -hmm. so you... It just, for me, it, it takes a, a kind of a constant awareness of, of where my intention and where my focus is, mm -hmm. because it's, it's so easy for me to slide across that spectrum without really paying attention to it, um, and to be thinking that I'm did, justified. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, but yeah, it is about the attitude, it is about what we've been entrusted with, and, and I think that it says something about the relationship that God has with all of us, that he's willing to let us play, let us be agents to the degree that we are in this plan of his. Um, and that sort of just acknowledging that helps me frame my mind in the right way. I agree. Uh, last night, one of the songs that we, uh, that we sang together uh, really struck home with me. It's um, all week I've been listening to a CD by the Gaithers. And so I wanted to sing the song last night and Bobby was good enough to, to let us sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. And, and some of you are singing it in your mind right now, and so am I. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the third guy had experienced being, being passed over. He looked and he'd seen guy number one gets five, guy number two gets, and I just get one. And so I, I want you to know that, Jordan, uh, part of my struggle is to not blame God for how he has blessed me in comparison to how he blesses you. Mm -hmm. He's God. He's God. He gets to do whatever he wants, right? Or are you going to tell him what to do? Because guy number three was really ready to tell him what to do. I think it was take your money and stick it somewhere, you know, right? Yeah, and you had even made the implication that it seems like 
there's an underlying thought of, if I was you, I could do your job better. Ever thought that about God? I could take care of things a little better than you? Yeah, that was the moment <laughs> when, when I suddenly remembered that he's got several other universes to run at the same time. <laughs> and and I, I, it makes me very, very glad, very, very happy to know that I am not God. Anyone out there want to say amen to that? Amen. I am not God. If we just had to say that to ourselves every day, I am not God. Thank you that I am not you, God, because your job is something I cannot do according to the ability that they had. God has infinite ability. Therefore, can we trust him today? Can we trust him today to take care of our situation? Okay? Uh, it comes down to, uh, I think we ended by, by saying, we need courage. We need courage to have faith. Okay, this is the, the this is the blind leap of faith. Indiana Jones is coming to mind. He's got to put his foot out and take the leap of faith. Okay, and he does it. He puts his foot down and he he hits that rock, but then his faith leaves him, and he grabs a handful of rocks and throws them across the pathway so that he can see the rest of the pathway. He does not continue. Some of us get the opportunity to do that, and we get a little little inkling of what might be ahead, and so we feel better, we're, we're able to trust God more, we have more faith. But you know what? I can guarantee you there are people sitting in this congregation right now who do not know what their next step is going to be. Okay? You don't know. And, and you're having to trust God again. You're having to have that faith. So we're going to tell you this morning, courage, brothers and sisters. <laughs> courage. Courage. Pray for courage that you can have the faith that you need in, in, in order to do the work. And the last, I think the last word that you brought up was unexpected. Yeah, we, we've been having these little nutshell statements in mind when we do our strategy powwows. And, you know, we say the kingdom of heaven is this, the kingdom of heaven is that. And we've kind of mentioned that over the couple of weeks. But I was sitting and thinking if we had to do one overarching thing, it's that the kingdom of heaven is unexpected. To me, that's what I get from these stories because Jesus, the way he tells all these parables, takes some left turns, especially if you know the cultural context that nobody would be expecting. And that's my sense of how it is to be an active participant of the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's going to take you places that are not you know, necessarily comfortable or familiar mm -hmm. if you've been living your life just you know if you, apart from I, I'm going to finish that sentence for you Please. if you've been living that if you've been living your life by the metrics of this world there you go is that something we can segue into next week when we begin the new series uh, the upside down kingdom if you live your life by the metrics that we are normally ready to live our lives by in this world then that's why I'm saying we're going to need to pray for courage to decide to trust God, to have faith in God, to live our life by these other metrics. Because, as I said to the Sabbath school class this morning, guess what? Maybe the blessings that he will bless us with, we won't recognize if you don't have the eyes of faith. I... I I, I even shudder to say that because suddenly I, I'm allowing God to do just about anything he wants. Are you, are you ready to leave here today saying, just as I am without one plea? Really? Because that's a really scary place to be. That's why I'm saying we're going to need courage. Leaving here, I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to say we need courage, God. Courage to trust you because... I, I really find it so hard to trust you with the outcomes, with the outcomes, because they are so unexpected. I cannot predict what God is going to do with you this week, but I can predict that he will walk with you and he will talk with you and he will give you courage and strength to follow him this week in, in whatever happens. And let me tell you, Chris and I know that there's crazy stuff happening, not only in our congregation, but in this town and in this in this area, and in this country, and in this world. Okay, there's just crazy stuff going on. And so 
uh, as we step out those doors, again, this week, we're going to need to grab a hold of Jesus like Jacob grabbed a hold of the angel and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. Amen.